Hi, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Oh, awesome. All right. So I have a question for you. Does anybody here happen to know what is the most common job for a male in the United States today? Most common job for a male in the United States today? Driver. Most common job is a driver, right? Whether that's a taxi driver, a truck driver, a driver of some sort. What's coming with technology real soon here? Driverless cars, you got it. Whoops, that's a problem. How about for a woman, for a female, in the United States, what's the most common job? Clerk slash server. Hmm, have you seen the kiosks already? Everywhere you go, you see the kiosks already. You see them, don't you? The self-checkouts. You see them everywhere, don't you? In the kiosks, everywhere. Oh my God, that's scary. Literally millions of jobs going away in the coming years. Gone. Gone. Oh my God. Should we be more afraid of technology? Should we be more afraid of foreigners? Should we be more afraid of corporations? Technology. If you're on the left right now, you easily just go, ah, it's because big corporations are evil. That's the reason why I punish them. That'll work. Drive this car, still come. Kiosks still come. If you're on the right, those me evil foreigners are taking our jobs. They're so bad. Stop them. Drive this car, still come. Kiosks still come. It isn't the key. The key is technology. We have to handle that, deal with that in the future. You, as a young and now, 18, 19, 20, 21, this is your number one issue to be concerned about, more than anything else. This is going to affect your job, your life now. But you're not 20, 21. You're 40, you're 50. Same thing. Technology is affecting you too. Doesn't matter. You must say, but wait a minute, Larry. Doesn't matter. Doesn't affect me. I'm not going to be a driver or a clerk. I'm going to college. I'm super smart. It's not going to affect me. I'm going to get an amazing college degree, right? Well, if you happen to know what's happening on Wall Street right now, there's a whole bunch of layoffs in the finance industry. Anybody happen to know why? Anybody? What's replacing all those cool financial analysts? Computers, Computers AI, exactly right. Artificial intelligence is actually managing and making decisions better than many analysts. And it's cheaper. More accurate and cheaper. AI doesn't ask for a bonus every year. AI doesn't want health care. AI doesn't need all those things. All of a sudden, they start getting laid off also. And these are educated, smart people who not only are educated and smart, but are aggressive. They think well. Gone. This is a serious issue for all of us to consider. And you might say, wait a minute, Larry, now I'm scared. <laughs> Why bother? The machine's taken over. It's the Terminator. It's Skynet. Oh my God, the world's going to end and we're all in trouble now. Not at all. This has happened before. Anybody, uh, if you think about artificial intelligence, think back in the day when we used to have the, the uh, chess game. Remember, I remember the, some of you people have some gray hair, like me. If you have some gray hair, you remember. When the chess games first came out, the computer, chess games first came out, the computer would most of the time lose to the chess master. Remember those days? The chess master used to beat the computer all the time. Then eventually it became a draw, and now almost always, computer beats chess master. Almost always. All the time. What now finally can beat AI? Do you know? Other AI. No? That's just two AIs. I don't want two AIs. That's a bad idea. Really bad idea. Let's make AI take care of AI take care of AI. Oh my God, right? That's, that's the sci-fi movie when the, the computers take over the world. What beats AI? Chess master plus AI. That beats AI. Does that make sense? But this happened literally thousands of years ago. Someone figured out if you had a plow, right, you could plow better and you farm better. That's awesome. Great. So now I'm good. I've got my plow. Well, let's, let's put a horse to the plow. Well, now the horse pulls the plow. Oh, don't need me anymore because the horse pulls the plow. What's better than a horse pulling a plow? A driver. Yeah. Someone driving the horse. Yeah. Person plus technology beats technology. That happens all the time, and it will keep happening. So if you want to, you can get mad and go, AI is going to kill us all. We're all going to die. Or you can say, how do I harness AI? How do I harness that thing? How do I become the driver? Because if I drive it, I can win. Now, how does it affect you in everyday life? We might say, well, Larry, that sounds good. 
So what I'll do is I'll become a good manager and I'll be fine. I hear this all the time. Some of you may know I've taught in many schools. I've taught at Yale, I've taught at Columbia, Baruch, John Jay, many schools. People say, great, I'll be a manager. Here's a problem. Still to this day, most colleges teach management. You might say, well, that's awesome, isn't it, Larry? No, it's not. Management is actually industrial level management. It's industrial level thought. We are now in a post-industrial world. A post-industrial world means it's no longer about process and resources. That's what management is about, processes and resources. That's nice. But guess what's getting better and better at handling processes and resources? AI. The one thing that we humans do well, and the only thing we can do well, is lead. And I will tell you if you are a youngin' now, and if you're someone who's not a youngin', but you're someone who's been a good manager or a good doer, you want to have a future? Your future is not in management. Your future is not doing. Your future is in leading. There's a distinction. In today's world, I don't need your arms and legs very much, particularly in America. I don't need that much. They're nice, but I can hire them overseas. I can buy them someplace else. I can get a machine to do that thing. Not that impressed. You know what I need from you? I need your innovation. I need your intellect. I need your initiative. I need your assertiveness. I need your ideas. I need your experience. That's what I need from you. Your arms and legs? Bleh. I'll buy them someplace else. Now that sounds terrible, but you're all seeing it happen. You may think I'm crazy. You're all seeing it happen. That means now I have to lead. I need to get people to give me their intellect. How in the world can I get someone to give me their initiative? How can I get someone to give me that enthusiasm? How can I do that? I have to get them to buy in. I have to get them to want to do it. It used to be perfect if I said, OK, Bob, do this. Phil, do that. Jane, do this. Alice, do that. I'm a great leader. Not good anymore. Not going to work at all. Now it's, Bob, take care of that issue. And as I'm talking, that issue is literally changing as I'm speaking. So by the time you get there, it's not what it was when I said go there. So how in the world could I tell you what to do? It's impossible. We've had this happen. You've all seen it, I'm sure. I say, go and do, go to this site and do X. You go to the site, you see it and go, it's not X. It's kind of X plus Y. So what do you do? You do X and come back. And I said, what happened? Why'd you do X? You saw it was X plus Y. Do what you said, boss. Do what you said. It's the concept in leadership today of never saying, who told you to do that? But instead saying, why'd you do that? And that might seem like a nuance, but it's huge. It's the difference in assigning blame or assigning responsibility. Blame doesn't help, responsibility does. It's a big difference in how you have to begin to lead. And you as youngsters should start thinking about that. How in the world can I not just be a doer? How in the world can I not just be a manager, but how in the world can I move people? Because the people who are the strongest and who will be the most successful are those who can move people, those who get others to buy in and say, I'm in, boss, I want it. You might say, but Larry, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be a server. I'm not going to be a driver. I'm not going to be in finance. None of that stuff. It doesn't affect me. I'm going to be a plumber. Awesome. Good for you. That's an amazing thing. World needs plumbers. Please be a plumber. But the same thing applies. I say to you now, hey, you, go to Bob or Phyllis's house and fix this type of thing. Well, how are you going to decide what to fix? What are you going to use? Probably technology, aren't you? You're probably going to have some kind of smartphone to talk to me about what's going on. You're probably going to have some type of uh, information on your smartphone on what type of technology is in that house. Technology affects you even if you're a plumber. But it doesn't matter if I'm going to be a plumber. Who cares? I've got to fix toilets and stuff. Yeah, but what kind of toilet? I'm not joking. What type? What kind of plumbing do I have? How old is the house? What are the codes that the local zoning uh, uh, say you can or cannot have or do? What do they say? All that will be required somehow on your phone. But Larry, I'm smart. I can remember things. I'm smart. Less and less value. Less and less value. But Larry, I have lots of data. So does Google. It has more than you. And it's more up to date than you are. And it changes without you having to study. 
Google's smarter than you, no matter how smart you might think you are. Google has more data than you, no matter how much data you think you have. Your goal is, how do I know what to look for? In the future, as you begin to move forward, I do not want you to think, I need to be able to show people how smart I am. Not helpful. Here's what's helpful. I need to show people what information they need. The difference between educating and curating. And the savviest people are able to curate. Because Google gives you everything. The question is, what do you search for? The question is, what data is real? The third question is, what data that I searched for that is real is valid to you, my customer, whoever my customer is. Whether my customer is internal to my boss, internal to my employees, or external to my client. It doesn't matter. That's what I need to be concerned about. Does that make sense, everybody? Mm -hmm. Am I scaring some of you? Good, don't be scared. If you have any questions, please tell me. I'm happy to hear that. But there are some advantages to this, though. Not only, not only is it good that we can control AI, absolutely, there's other things that happen. AI does something else. It allows us to be more equal. It provides more of an equal playing field. That's an advantage, right? Because you use technology to get around things. Now it's only about the value you can bring. It will make us more equal. It's wonderful. It will actually be equal for, for male to female, equal for ethnic backgrounds, more equal for blue collar and white collar. Everything can become more equal. There's an opportunity for us to become more equal. Isn't that great? Yes, no, maybe? There's also an opportunity to fracture us even more. It is both. Because as we make technology and it gets so, so targeted, each of us has their own special, unique media. We have a fractured media. And we watch what we want to watch. So while there is an opportunity for us all to be equal because of technology, that's awesome, there's also an opportunity for us all to be divvied up even more. Divvied up more and divvied up more. So you as the leaders, the young leaders coming up, you guys are thinking to yourself, am I doing things that are helping us to become more equal and more fair? Or am I doing things that are helping us to become more divided? And when is that appropriate? Are we okay? Good, hold on. Good. All right. There is one huge issue, though, that we have with AI. While it can be wonderful and allow us to curate and make us help, what does AI require? Anybody know what AI requires to be good? How can it be good? What does it require? Data. You got it. Big data. Big data is the problem when it comes to AI. Big data. Now, why does big data matter? It's good. If we have big data, I get good AI. I get good results. The more data I give my artificial intelligence, the better it will be, the more effective it will be, the more efficient it will be. This is a good thing, isn't it? Yes? Great. What's the bad thing? Come on, guys. Help me out. What's the bad thing? Who controls the data? But who has the data? We don't always know. We don't always know who has all of our data. And not only can I use that data to make the world a better place, I can also use that data to make the world a worse place. I can use that data to manipulate you, can't I? I can use that data to ask you to do things you shouldn't do. Big data is a worry. It is a problem. Absolutely. We're concerned about it, as you should be. Not just that. You have all of your data in one spot. What happens if I now get your data? Yes. I now have your data. So once I have your data, what happens if you don't want that data out? That's correct. You will do what I tell you to do, won't you? Or your life is ruined. Either one. You see it happening all the time, don't you? What happens to your point when the data is corrupt? Because the sad point is you know this. When the data is big and awesome, and you see the, the information come from big data, what do we assume? It's true. What happens when it's not true? I control the data, and I try to get bad stuff on you, but there's no bad stuff on you. So I just make bad stuff up on you. That's it. Yes, you used to kick puppies when you were seven. That was you. <laughs> Done. I put that in the data. It comes out. People go, oh, he's a puppy kicker. Who are they going to believe? You or big data? It's big data. 
Now, why do I say all these things? These fears, here's the reason why. When this happens, there is going to be, without question, there's going to be a bunch of disruption. It's gonna happen. It's happening here, it's happening across the country, it's happening across the world. So what happens when there's disruption? What do we want? Things are disrupting, what do we do? What do we want? Yes, we do, absolutely. So who can stabilize things fast? Say again? Military. Yes, dictatorships, boy can't they. Yes, they can. Let's pass a law. Let's have a dictator. Let's have a strong man because I feel scared. Remember a very important thing in your life, please remember this always. People who are afraid make bad decisions. Please, I'll say it again. People who are afraid make bad decisions. That includes you, me, anybody. You're afraid you make bad decisions. I'm afraid disruption. I'm gonna make a bad decision. Now here's the problem. Whenever that happens, what's the first thing we say? There ought to be a law. Ought to be a law. That'll fix it. Ought to be a law. And here's the problem. It does work for short term. I'll give you something to really think about as you're trying to think about how do, I hand, how do you handle this disruption. Remember something. At the end of almost every law, as you walk down that road, at almost every law at the end is a guy or a gal with a gun who will put you in a cage. No matter what. At the end of that rope, somehow, there is a guy or a gal with a gun who will put you in a cage. Which means law is force. Government is law. Government is force. Does that mean I should never use force? No, sometimes you should. Absolutely. If there's a victim, someone's going to be hurt. Absolutely. Yes, of course. There are times to use force. Defend yourself, defend your family, defend your rights. Of course, there are times to use it. Absolutely. The question is, is disruption the right time for force? And here's the problem we're going to have. And this is for you people who are young right now. In the next five or ten years, as this becomes worse, countries like China are going to react quickly. Very quickly. And it's going to look amazing because they're gonna have what all laws create, short-term success. Very true, short-term success. But in the long run, they're gonna pay dearly. And the best example I have right now in China is the one-child family, the one-child family policy. Remember that? They said, everyone in China can only have one child. Was that a short-term solution? Absolutely, 100%. That was a short-term win. Well done, less, less population growth. China, what a win. Now, how much are they paying? with 50 to 100 million extra women, and com um, um, uh, men compared to women, with huge problems with social issues. Certain villages that are three to one, male to women. They're paying a long-term price for a short-term gain. But it sounded good when they started it. It will happen here now too. We have a drug problem, marijuana. Let's start a war on drugs. Short-term solution, people go to jail. Now look at the legacy we have now. Again and again and again, when we decide to use force and we think that's the answer, we have a short-term gain and long-term pain. When this disruption hits you, you will be the ones deciding. You'll be the ones voting. You'll be the ones in charge. You will be the ones who will be deciding what we do when this happens. It's the next five or ten years. How are you going to act? And I would ask you, take the short-term pain for the long-term gain. Anything you've done in life, some of you here who have gray hair like me, everything you've been proud of, that you're so happy you've done was short-term pain and you got long-term gain from it. Youngsters now, think about that same thing. When it becomes tough, think about it. Short-term pain for long-term gain is the way it works. And what does that mean? That means allowing people to make errors. That means allowing people to find the right answer. It means assuming you don't have every answer. And this goes to my leadership piece. The best leaders know something. The best leaders know they don't have all the answers. They have all the questions. They don't have all the answers. If you think you have to be the smartest person in the room, you're going to fail. Because no matter how smart you are, and I'm sure many of you are very smart, you will never always be the smartest person in the room. And even if you are, you won't have all the information you always need. There's always somebody else there who knows something, who can think of something, who can make something happen. The idea of freedom, as Kevin mentioned, is not just in politics, it is obviously, but it's also in daily life.
It's in your business. Now, some of you might know some of my background. I spent some time training organizations, helping them to grow, helping leaders. And when leaders come to me and say, Larry, my people won't be innovative. They won't be innovative. I can't get them to do things. I don't get it. I tell them to, I order them to, and they don't. I don't understand why they won't be creative. Here's what I never say. You know what you need? Iron fist. More punishment. I never say that ever. Well, I'll just create rules. That's what I'll do. And I'll force them to give me this and to give me that. I'll create more rules. That'll work because then I'll give them more of a box for rules. That'll work. I'll give them a lot of rules. That'll help. I say, no. Then they'll hide behind the rules. If you instead allow your leadership, and for those of you who are starting businesses, those of you getting into uh, other groups, we need to lead people. If you give them freedom to do the right thing, go do it. Here's the goal. Are you with me? Yes, let's go do this thing. You will find your best and motivated leaders will move to the top. And your worst ones will actually also come out as bad leaders. They can't hide behind the policies. People who fail, you give them a second chance. You will find innovation. You will find us to grow. The last piece I'll bring up on the future of the economy. How many people here, students only, how many of you share your homework? Anybody share your homework? Yes. You guys don't share? Oh, you don't want to tell me. It's okay. You share your homework. Yes. I know. I have a daughter too. Yes. Share the homework. Share the homework. Yes. You all share your homework. Yes. Share your homework. How many of you are in high school shared your homework? Yes. Shared your homework. Absolutely. 100%. All the time. Yeah. This is a sharing economy. This is a sharing world. And the people who, weren't, who didn't grow up that way think that's weird. I think it's odd. Head, now the head, head's nodding. Yes, I think it's odd. What? You share? No, you can't do that. Yes. And I'm asking you, if you're doing it now, remember, this is the concept of no zero-sum game. Everyone shares. This doesn't just work in your high school and in your college, which you're doing already. It works in business, too. It works in life. The sharing economy works. We shouldn't fight it, but we do. We fight Uber. We fight Airbnb. We fight everything that shares. We try to block Facebook. We try our best to block, 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 block. Does it work? No, because someone else always picks it up. Someone else always picks it up because this is the new way. The new way is sharing. And if you people who are a little bit older than the youngsters here, and it may be odd for you, understand that's the future. Sharing is everything. Sharing is the way. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be embarrassed by it and know you're going to be doing that. And here's the best part about it. The best leaders don't care who gets the credit. The best leaders, their job is to make sure things get done. Not that they do them. Now, some of you also may know, sometimes I actually have been brought into different companies to lead some companies. I've been an officer in public companies twice. I've been an officer in a public company where I don't know what the actual company does very well. How? I do it because I lead well and the people beneath me to get buy-in and to make things work. You empower people and you win. Leadership is all about getting people to buy in, not being the smartest person. Here's the piece that's most important for you youngsters. The odds are you will have at least five careers. I didn't say five jobs. At least five careers. I've had five. I've had five careers, not jobs, careers. The odds you have at least five careers. How in the world can you have five careers? How can you master five careers? You can't, and it's okay, because the data is already there for you. Does it make sense? Your job is to curate and gather what you need and to lead others to make things happen. If you lead well, if you curate well, you will easily transition from one career to the next. If you think you have to be an expert in every career, you will struggle. And the reason why you leave careers is not because of opportunity, because of this. You get stuck and you can't advance. She changed careers. You get stuck. You can't advance. You change careers. You get stuck. You can't advance. But if you lead well, you change careers because opportunity is there. This is the thing that makes you just get out of bed and jump because you want to be part of it. What I know most of you youngsters are talking about and thinking about, some of you don't even know, what you want more than anything else is community and purpose. Number one, people always talk about this. You millennials, you guys don't want anything. You guys don't work well. I hear that all the time, and they're wrong. Because I've seen you work in nonprofits. And I've seen you work so hard that you literally sleep under the desk. Yes, 
Literally sleep under the desk. Don't shower, you should shower by the way, but don't shower, get back to work. Work that hard and get paid virtually nothing. Just a living wage. You don't care because you've got your backpack with your Netflix subscription, so you're good. And you go back, if you're in New York City, you have six roommates and you're fine with it because you're doing something that matters. And you're good about that. I get that. Some of us people with gray hair, we don't get that. We wanted community and we wanted purpose too. But if we didn't get it, we didn't quit our jobs. You guys will. You'll just walk away. And you have three, four, five, six, seven jobs. What I'm asking you, if you're a youngster, look for that purpose now. You're going to have five careers. You should be working your first one right now. Physically working your first one right now. This is the last piece I'll touch in this whole piece, and I'll take as many questions as you like. If you are 16 years or older and not actively somehow working in a job or a corporation or a nonprofit or something, you are cheating yourself. You need to be in something, around someone, doing something, getting experience. But Larry, I'm going to have a cool degree. So what? So what? I don't care. I know people who have degrees from Ivy League and the baristas at Starbucks, Manhattan. I'm not joking. Some of you know people like that. Master's degrees, baristas at Starbucks. I'm going to tell you a little trend that's happening in, in the tech field specifically, but also growing in the marketing field. And that is, if you have a master's degree, if you're a small, if this is a small business, they will not hire you. You are no hire. They will literally say, ah, too much, no hire. They haven't done anything. They spent all the time in school, they haven't done anything, no hire. This does not at all apply to large corporations, academia, or government. Academia, government, large corporations love lots of education. If you plan on working there, please get lots of education. If they love that stuff, please do it. It's a great idea. If you're looking for something small, tiny, don't get education. Get your bachelor's degree, wonderful, but get experience. If you don't have experience with your degree, you're not going to be hireable if you want to be in a small company. Now, I'm not saying you should or shouldn't be in one. I'm saying find your passion now, start your first career, your second or third one will come. Are we okay? So I hope I wasn't too scary, but I want you guys to know that what I love about it is you guys are making lots of changes, a lot of stuff is happening, but you're going to be in charge soon. Don't take the short-term option, take the long-term option. Thank you.